The Beringian migration myths, why the peopling of the Americas by foot is mathematically and logistically impossible, by Robert John Langdon. Over a decade ago in my book, Dawn of the Lost Civilization, I proposed that the Americas were populated not by a trickle of Siberian nomads trudging across the Bering Land Bridge, but by a maritime culture capable of long distance sea travel. At the time, this idea challenged academic orthodoxy. Today, however, mathematical modelling, archaeological evidence and DNA analysis all converge to vindicate this theory and expose the Berengia first hypothesis as not only implausible, but mathematically bankrupt. So one, human migration is diffusion, not deterministic marching. Migration in prehistoric times followed a biological constant, diffusion. Humans do not move in armies across continents. They spread slowly, opportunistically and unevenly. Typical migration rates are 10 to 20 kilometers per generation with only one to five percent of a parent population moving outward in any direction. For a migration to succeed, it must be driven by population pressure, environmental opportunity and sustainable demographics. This matters because the bearing gear model demands a sustained wave of foot migration over thousands of kilometers of glacial terrain with infants, elderly and families through marginal environments with low food yields. It's not just logistically difficult, it's mathematically impossible. Two, the minimum viable population problem. Genetic studies suggest the founding population of the Americas was at least 5,000 to 10,000 individuals. This is the minimum required to avoid inbreeding, genetic drift and extinction over the long term. But to achieve that via gradual foot-based migration, you'd need a source population of at least 500,000 people within 1,000 kilometers of the Bering Land Bridge, applying conservative 2% outward diffusion and attrition rate. But where are they? Eastern Siberia, around 20,000 years ago, had no such numbers. Population densities in Ice Age Eurasia were often below 0.01 people per square kilometre. Our model shows that to house 500,000 people within 1,000 kilometres of Beringia, you'd need densities of 0.16 per square kilometre, over 10 times higher than anything supported by the archaeological or paleoecological record. 3. The archaeological hotspot problem. If the land bridge theory is correct, we should find dense clusters of archaeological sites in eastern Siberia, Beringia, Alaska, Interior, Canada. Instead, we find the opposite. These regions are largely sterile before approximately 13,000 BP. The oldest robust sites in the Americas, Monte Verde, Chile, Gore, Texas and Buttermilk Creek are thousands of kilometres south of where the migration allegedly began. Fourth, maritime migration, a model that matches the evidence. Unlike foot migration, seaborne migration enables rapid coastal colonisation. Our model simulates a founding population of 1,000 boat users landing on the east coast of North America or the Pacific coast of South America with only a 2% annual growth rate. They reach millions in under 500 years. They spread over 40,000 kilometers off coastline. This matches known archaeological data far better than the Beringian land model. 5. Genetic and linguistic corroboration DNA analysis also supports this maritime model. Multiple lineages, mtDNAx, C1b, D1, suggest polycentric migration, not a single northern bottleneck. 
Linguistic diversity is highest in South America and the Gulf Coast, not the North. Native populations in Alaska and Canada show lower genetic diversity consistent with late back migrations rather than origins. 6. Indigenous settlement patterns, another nail in the coffin. Modern and historic indigenous population distributions further contradict the land bridge hypothesis. The densest populations were found in eastern North America, Mesoamerica and South America, not Alaska or the Northwest. The great river systems, Mississippi Amazon and temperate woodlands, supported large complex societies. Northern and interior Canada remain sparsely populated, both today and in prehistory. If migration began in Alaska, we'd expect density to decline as you move south and east. Instead, it's the reverse. Genetically, this is backed by greater diversity in the south than in the north. Founder effects in northern populations implying back migration. This strongly suggests the north was populated last, not first, and the migration direction is south to north, not the other way around. 7. Clovis people and European DNA. The Solutrean connection. Further complicating the Beringia narrative is the discovery that some Clovis era skeletal remains contain mitochondrial DNA of European origin, particularly haplogroup X2A, which is absent in Asia. This suggests an alternative migration route, one that may have crossed the North Atlantic via Ice Age sea routes. The so-called Solutrean hypothesis posits that people from Ice Age Europe using boats and coastal navigation followed the edge of Atlantic sea ice to reach the Americas. Clovis tool technology has notable similarities with solitary and lithics from France and Iberia, a convergence too specific to ignore. Crucially, these genetic clues are backed by morphological studies of early skeletal remains that show distinctively European cranial features, further weakening the Asia-only model. Though controversial, these findings offer empirical support for the idea that the Americas may have been settled by multiple seafaring groups, not just from the West, but from the East as well. 8. The climate and survival impossibility of the Beringian crossing. What real Arctic migration looks like. An ethnographic reality check. To further dismantle the Beringian migration theory, we turn to the lived experience of modern indigenous Arctic populations, including the Inuit, Nenets, Ivenki and Chochi, who survive in tundra and permafrost regions today. These groups, who represent the closest real-world analogue to Ice Age conditions, exhibit very limited seasonal mobility. Typical seasonal ranges, 50 to 150 kilometre radius. Daily movement on foot with families and supplies, two to five kilometers. Movement is circular and seasonal, not linear or expansionist. Migrations happen in stages over decades or generations, not all at once. These communities rely on dog sleds or reindeer teams, pre-built shelters, caches and geographic knowledge, return point mobility and meaning they rarely move into completely unknown territory unless forced studies show that even under ideal hunting conditions. Winter travel without sleds rarely exceeds five kilometers per day. Continuous long distance migration greater than 1000 kilometers is almost unheard of. Yet the Beringia theory asks us to believe that Stone Age families without domesticated animals, sleds or mapped routes crossed 4000 to 5,000 kilometres of frozen food-scarce tundra. With no infrastructure across generations, leaving little archaeological trace. This is not just implausible, it is completely out of sync with everything we know about Arctic human behaviour. If real Arctic peoples don't migrate that way today, 
it's extremely unlikely their Ice Age counterparts did either. That's nine. The persistence of a flawed theory. Despite these overwhelming problems, the Beringia hypothesis remains dominant. Why? It's simple and linear, easy to teach, easy to accept. One land bridge, one direction. It's institutionally entrenched. The theory was cemented before radiocarbon dating or genetics. Early 20th century archaeology assumed Clovis was first, and that assumption stuck. Challenging it is dangerous. Researchers who question it face academic backlash. Entire careers and grants are built on maintaining the status quo. Coastal evidence is underwater. Rising seas have buried the most likely early coastal sites, so the absence of evidence is used to, to maintain the theory. Textbooks and museums haven't caught up. Many still present the Bering Land Bridge as an unchallenged truth. Ultimately, this is not just an anthropological issue, it's a political and institutional one. The land bridge survives, not because it is the best explanation, but because it is the least disruptive to the current academic structure. As conclusion, the numbers don't lie and the boats don't sink. The Beringian land migration theory was built on assumption, not arithmetic. When tested against known population dynamics, archaeological footprints, climate data and genetic diversity, it fails on all fronts. The survival requirements and ethnographic parallels render it logistically absurd. Meanwhile, the idea proposed in dawn of the lost civilization of an ancient seafaring culture spreading rapidly along the coast not only survives scrutiny, but now stands on firm empirical ground. We know that Mesolithic populations in Northern Europe had seafaring capability with dugout canoes and log boats recovered from sites such as neuen sur seine Starkar and Pes. These crafts date back over 10,000 years, long before Polynesian populations began voyaging the Pacific. Unlike speculative South Pacific migration, Northern Hemisphere Mesolithic boat use is archaeologically attested. A maritime migration model is not only plausible, it's inevitable. The combination of seafaring knowledge, abundant river systems, and evidence of European skeletal DNA and crania, the combination of seafaring knowledge, abundant river systems, and evidence of European skeletal DNA and cranial morphology in Clovis culture, makes a south-north diffusion pattern via the Atlantic and internal riverways, like the Mississippi and its tributaries, far more likely than any east-west ice trek. The absence of early Polynesian maritime culture and the abundance of Mesolithic boat finds in Europe underscores the feasibility of Atlantic entry and internal expansion. It's time the archaeological community recalibrates its models, leaves behind Ice Age dogma and begins to take seriously the evidence that our ancestors were far more capable and mobile than they are usually given credit for. The solution isn't just mathematical, it floats.